Okay, so we're going to look at the spiritual realm. And particularly we're going to look at spiritual warfare. This is something that people have in their heads, kind of like completely the wrong idea about. They've got a lot of mythology in their heads. And perhaps people here aren't in the same position. But if, if as we're going through this, you see where the scriptures are, it'd be good for you to take note mentally where they are so that if you're speaking to someone about these things, you can walk them through it yourself. You know, you, people will, will come, uh, you will come across people who have all of these funny ideas in their heads about the spiritual realm. So it's, it's useful that you're able to say, well, no, from this place or that place. And if any material comes up and you're familiar with the material, then learn the material so that you can say it to someone else. Okay, so the, the basic lie, the basic harm that is done by the mythology of this spiritual warfare idea is that this is the situation that we have. Okay, that it's Yeshua or Yehovah against Hasatan and they're matched against each other and it's a battle and you know, Hasatan's got his forces, the Lord's got his forces and they're really fighting against each other. The truth of the situation is that Yehovah could just destroy these people Immediately, if he wanted to, he could just destroy them. Ahasatan does have kind of like a foothold in this world. When it says he's the God of this age, though, it doesn't mean that he's God over the world. It just means he is the God of the people of this age. It's, he's, all of the world, though, is not under Hasatan's control. Okay, it's all under Yehovah's control. It's not like the Illuminati bringing in these people according to their Satanist agenda or whatever. It's all Yehovah that's doing all these things. It tells us in scripture, it's him who's bringing it all about. So we need to understand things, not really from the perspective of just the, the usual way that people talk about them, but we need to examine these things in the scriptures to see what, what's actually happening. So when it comes to spiritual warfare, these are the things that we'll look at today. It's useful to go through them at the beginning rather than me try to explain a scripture to you you not know where I'm going, and then by the time I've got to the explanation of the scripture, you would need for me to start again with the explanation so that you could get it all the way through. It's useful to if we've just got some bullet points. Spiritual warfare is the means by which we resist evil, but not how we resist evil spirits and all of that sort of thing, or not in the way that people think anyway. Spiritual warfare is not us fighting against spirits. That's not what spiritual warfare is. Yeshua taught us how to properly do spiritual warfare, and we'll be looking at that. If we're obedient to the word, Hasatan cannot touch us. Okay, absolutely can't touch us. You know, you'll hear, hear people all the time who profess to be followers of Yahuwah who say that they're under some kind of spiritual attack or, you know, whatever. Uh, like they're at the mercy of Hasatan. Scripture tells us absolutely plainly that Hasatan cannot touch us. Yehovah will guard us against the evil one if we're obedient. And Hasatan is a pawn of Yehovah. Okay, and all of these evil spirits, all of the whole demonic realm, all of that sort of stuff, they're all pawns of Yehovah. He set it all forth, or set it all in motion from the beginning, knowing exactly what the end would be. And these things are under his authority. They've been given authority, but they are under his authority ultimately. If we're enticed after Hasatan's schemes, then we make ourselves vulnerable to being deceived by deceptive spirits. We make ourselves actually vulnerable to deception okay, by being lured away after Hasatan's schemes. And we might think, oh, there's this bit of sin in my life and it's okay, nothing, nothing bad's even happening. And yet we can be being led away, led astray, listening to a voice that we think that this is Yehovah when it's in fact not and to the evil powers of this world. And Hasatan is granted authority to trouble us. He's granted that authority by Yehovah, and it's by bringing accusations against us. We're probably all familiar with the language of Hasatan being the accuser. I'm gonna have a look at what, what exactly that consists of. Okay, so in order for us to understand the illustrations that I'm gonna use, okay, we need to understand the actual key to them, because otherwise I'm just gonna show you pictures and they're gonna look like a load of colored blobs. If you see an orange dot 
That represents a person, a person in the world, not one of Yehovah's people. If you see a blue dot, it represents one of Yehovah's people. When you see a black dot, it is an enemy, um, physical enemy of, um, of Yehovah's people. A physical enemy, not like an enemy like a spirit or anything like that. You see one of these uh, green circles with blue outline. That is one of Yehovah's angels. And if you see something like this, okay, this lighter green with the blue circle around it, anything inside of that is under Yehovah's protection. Okay, so now you can understand the pictures as we go through. So in Torah portion, Balak, this is the scene that we had. We had a cliff overlooking uh, a valley. That's where the children of Israel were. And Balak, an enemy, was there, and he was there with Bilam, who was one of Yehovah's people. He wasn't walking very well, but he knew who Yehovah was. He spoke to Yehovah, and he operated by the spirit of Yehovah on occasion. And they were overlooking the children of Israel in the valley. Now we read this in the Torah portion when we went through it. How do I curse whom Eil has not cursed? How do I rage at whom Yehovah has not raged? So what was the, the problem that was stopping Bilam from coming against the people? It was that they were under Yehovah's blessing. They were not cursed by Yehovah. And he said, he has not looked upon wickedness in Yaakov, nor has he seen trouble in Yisrael. Yehovah is Elohim, is with him, and the shout of a king is in him. Okay, so there's no iniquity. There's no sin in Jacob. If there was, it would be a different matter. It says, Eil who brought them out of Mitzrayim is for them like the horns of a wild ox. So we know if he is for us, who can be against us? For there is no sorcery against Yaakov, nor is there any divination against Yisrael. Okay, so these things, these kind of these evil spiritual applications, sorcery, divination, that sort of thing, cannot come against Israel unless they are doing wickedness. So they were in the valley and they were under Yehovah's protection. This is what Balak sees as he looks out. Okay? He's got all the people who are blessed. And it's kind of, he says to him, doesn't he? Oh, come up, come up to another place. You can't see all of them from here. Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of Yehovah live, leads to life and he remains satisfied. He is not visited by evil. So if you've got people saying that they're visited by evil, and they follow Yehovah, the word tells us that they shouldn't be. And so these things are used by Yehovah and they're used to highlight a problem. It might be a problem in someone's life that they can't even see is there, but they know from the word that there must be a problem there if these things are occurring in their life. Okay, so Yehovah uses these things for good. He doesn't just want to blast somebody. He doesn't just want to punish someone and for them to go off to destruction. He wants to bring these things to their attention. The angel of Yehovah encamps around all those who fear him and rescues them. Okay. Now we're going to look later on at the actual where there is spiritual warfare happening in the spiritual realm where there are angels and there are, you know, Hasatan's angels as well. And there is actually spiritual warfare. And you'll see sometimes Yehovah sends an angel into this world where Hasatan has this foothold where he has his forces and he'll send this angel in. He's not thinking though that maybe the angel's not going to make it. He knows the angel is going to be victorious. Yehovah has power over all these things so he can send in his spiritual forces and they will overcome. The angel of Yehovah will rescue people. We know that everyone having been born of Elohim, what did it say before? That he who has been born of Elohim does righteousness, okay? Does not sin. But the one having been born of Elohim guards himself. He protects himself by not sinning. Okay, just as we saw in the Torah portion, sorcery divination could not come against Yaakov. The wicked one does not touch him. So again, if these people are having um, evil influence over them, then it's because there's a problem in their walk. Psalm 23, 45 says, When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, 
Okay, your authority, your discipline, perhaps, they comfort me. You spread before me a table in the face of my enemies. You see, you spread a table before me. I'm here with abundant blessing in the face of my enemies. My enemies cannot touch me. I'm here eating luxuriously from Yahuwah's table in the face of my enemies. Okay, so these things, obviously, they are our enemies. Okay, they are opposed to us, but they cannot touch us if we are guarding ourselves. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Yehovah, maker of the heavens and the earth. He does not allow your foot to be moved. He who watches over you does not slumber. See, he who is guarding Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. There's some kind of spiritual attack coming. It's not because Yehovah is slack in guarding over Israel. Yehovah is your God. Yehovah is your shade at your right hand. The sun does not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Yehovah guards you from all evil. He guards your soul. Okay, soul and spirit are bound up with one another. And the word of Elohim is so sharp that it could divide the sun that even soul and spirit. Yehovah guards your going out and your coming in now and forever. It's a promise from Yehovah. Yehovah is trustworthy who shall establish you and guard you from the wicked one. He will do this. He's not slack in what he's doing. There's a problem, there's a problem. David says in uh, 2 Samuel 22, he says, He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those hating me, for they were stronger than I. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but Yehovah was my support. And he brought me out into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Yehovah rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands before Yehovah. So how clean your hands are before Yehovah is how he's going to reward you, how he's going to protect you. And we saw in Revelation 2 verse 14, it says that Balaam taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat food offered to idols and to commit fornication. So Balaam was tempting the children of Israel to do these two things. And by doing so, he took them out from under Yehovah's protection. And Moshe said to them, have you kept all the women alive? The women are the ones who caused the children of Israel through the word of Balaam to trespass against Yehovah. Okay, and then there was a plague in the congregation. So what happened? They were all under the protection of Yehovah. Then along came a load of women into the camp. They intermingled among the children of Israel, and they invited them to worship their gods and to go astray. The children of Israel left Yehovah's protection, and Yehovah removed this protection from them, and the plague struck them. Jeremiah 50, 6-7 says, My people have been wandering sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. Turning them away on the mountains, they've gone from mountain to hill. They've forgotten their resting place. Now, it's something that we see quite a bit throughout the word. It doesn't matter how the people are led astray. Okay, If the people are led astray by their shepherds or if they're led astray by the women of uh, the Midianites, it doesn't actually matter how they're led astray. Both people, the one doing the leading astray, and the people themselves bear their guilt. And we saw that with Hasatan when the curse came upon the serpent and the curse also came upon Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve. All who found them have devoured them and their adversaries have said, we are not guilty because they have sinned against Yehovah. Okay, so when the adversaries come against them, they do not bear guilt because they've sinned against Yehovah. 2 Kings 6, 14 to 18, it says, And he sent horses and chariots, a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Okay, so we've got the city here. On the wall, we've got Elisha and his servant. Okay, when they look out, they see this great army surrounding them. And the servant of the man of Elohim rose early and went out and saw an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Oh, my master, what do we do? And he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Yehovah, I pray, open his eyes and let him see. Just like uh, Bilam had his eyes opened and he could see the angel of Yehovah. 
And Yehovah opened the eyes of the young man and he looked and saw the mountain covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Okay, so these are human enemies that were coming against them. Just as David talks about his human enemies that were coming against him. He said there's more with us than there are with them. It's just them in the physical realm. This verse is interesting. It says, And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to Yahweh and said, Strike this nation with blindness, I pray. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So it's not actually clear from this whether the ones who came down to him were all of the host of Yahuwah who were around him. And he prayed and said, Strike this nation with blindness. And they went out and struck them with blindness. Or whether when this army came down to them, they were struck uh, with blindness but their protection was all of these spiritual entities and the prayer that he makes is that they are struck with blindness so I don't know exactly how all of this works but Yehovah will protect us from physical enemies as well and perhaps he uses spiritual entities to do his bidding in the physical world perhaps it was them that caused the blindness in the people Second Corinthians 2 verses, uh, verse 11 should draw attention to something that we, we need to be aware of uh, Paul says, lest Hasatan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So Paul mentions Hasatan's schemes here. Okay, and regrettably, most people are ignorant of his schemes. They think the schemes of Hasatan are something else. They've been sold this lie that the schemes of Hasatan are something else, that they're, you know, whatever, whatever people believe. Okay, what we're actually going to look at is his uh, his actual schemes in this. So, so far we've had orange dot person, blue dot one of Yehovah's people, black dot an enemy, one of Yehovah's angels and Yehovah's protection. We're going to see some more now. If you see a purple dot, it's a deceptive spirit. Okay, a red dot is a demonic spirit. Okay, perhaps a spirit that's doing something that is uh, destructive. If you see a small dot. That is a spirit of a small amount of power. If you see a big dot, a spirit of a big amount of power. If you, see, if you see a large red dot, that is Hasatan. Okay? Does everyone get the key? Okay? I'm going to test you. Orange dot. Blue dot. Back dot. Purple dot. Red dot. Small. Big. Angel. Hasatan. And. Okay, so everyone's going to get it now. It's not just going to look like some kind of weird psychedelic picture. So in the world, we've got a world full of people who are not Yehovah's people. Okay, and in the world, some of them are going to be under the influence of demonic spirits. And they're not under his protection. And I've spoken myself about when I was under the influence of deceptive spirits and come into spiritual knowledge. Okay. Also, there are people who are under the influence or under the uh, effect of demonic spirits as well. I see people talking about things like poltergeist activity or whatever whatever demonic activity that people talk about. It actually seems to me that these things are less uh, overt in the world nowadays because if you make the spirit realm less obvious, then people don't think in those terms. They don't, you know, it leads to things like atheism and a very, um, what's the word, materialistic view of the world. Not like I want loads of stuff, but the material world is all that there is. Okay, so this person, they become one of Yehovah's people. They turn to Yah. Obviously, it said, you set a table for me in the face of my enemies. The enemies are aware of us. So, this person paints a, a big target on their head, basically. And the deceptive spirits, the demonic spirits, that come in and want to affect this person. But this person who's just turned to Yah, who's fearing Elohim, is protected by Yah's angels. We're told this in scripture. So it doesn't matter how many uh, spirits come against them, they're protected by the angels. Yehovah will, and we will see this, he will allow, though, the influence, perhaps, of a deceptive spirit. 
Okay, the deceptive spirit will come in, and these things come in in order to test somebody to see where their hearts are at. Okay, a deceptive spirit might come and tell them, you don't need to bother with that. You don't need to bother with this. Okay, this is the case now. We've got the Holy Spirit. We don't need to wear uh, zit zit or whatever the lie is, and it tests somebody's heart. So this person recently come to the Lord, and they go about on their business throughout the world, and they come to somebody else who is one of Yehovah's people right here. They've got a deceptive spirit as well. And maybe, maybe Yah has allowed this situation so that this deceptive spirit can confirm the words of this deceptive spirit, telling the two people the same thing. Because these deceptive spirits can work in collusion with one another, familiar spirits, okay? They can tell mediums, we've looked at the idea of mediums before, they can tell mediums information, and the spirit realm operates separately from ours, but it's just as real, it's just there, we just need to have our eyes open in order to experience it. Okay, so maybe this is a test to see where this person's heart is at. Let's say the person passes the test, they go on through their life, this person's still left with their delusion, this Person here, one of Yehovah's peoples, outside of the protection of Yehovah, though plagued by a demonic spirit, a deceptive spirit. Person continues through their life, and through Yehovah's grace, he leads them into the protection of being in his word. Okay, so now, these people, or these deceptive spirits, demonic spirits, cannot come against them. Hasatan cannot touch them. Yehovah guards them from the evil one. Okay. What Hasatan has to do in this situation, he can't directly come to this person and trouble him, okay? So what Hasatan needs to do is some kind of enticement. Come, just come and leave Yehovah's protection. You want this? This is, uh, this is better for you, isn't it? So the person leaves the protection of Yehovah willingly, willfully of their own free will, and then They can be plagued by all of these things. I'm not saying this is what's going to happen, that all of the demonic spirits are going to come upon this person. We know, in fact, that this is not what happens. Hasatan is more subtle in the way that he plays things out. Okay, he's not just going to have somebody who was previously under Yehovah's protection just swamped by demonic spirits. That wouldn't really fulfill his ends. The person, though, can repent. The influence of Hasatan is then broken, and they're ushered back into the protection of Yehovah's world, okay? If they're there, Hasatan can't touch them, the other ones can't touch them. So, you get a deceptive spirit come and whisper some nonsense to them. Are Paul's letters really Yah's words? Maybe it's not a deceptive spirit, maybe it is another believer who's under the influence of these deceptive spirits and come along and say, is Yeshua contradicting the Tanakh? Is he? We don't have to wear zit zit anymore. Paul taught the Gentiles shouldn't be circumcised. Okay, and it's, it's a test. Okay, what's well, the person who's in Yehovah's protection? What are they going to do? Are they going to remain in the word and say, well, maybe I don't understand those things, but I'm going to seek Yehovah and seek to understand them? Or are they going to be tempted to leave the word? All Hasatan is concerned with is that he entices them out. He doesn't care what the enticement is. It could be sin, it could be a lie that the person wants to believe. Whatever it is, they're enticed out of Yehovah's protection. But we know that the wicked one does not touch somebody who has been born of Elohim and is walking in the word. So what about this guy? Okay, this is an artist's impression of Job. Okay, so people have their own understanding of what was going on with Job. That Job was a righteous man. He was, you know, he was a great guy, Job, and um, Yah just let Hasatan have influence over his life. If what I've just been saying is true, then the wicked one wouldn't be touching Job. So maybe that scripture's wrong. Okay? Job was a man who was under Yehovah's protection, but we do know one thing about Job. Or Job. Yehovah removed his protection from him. So what we need to do is we need to understand the story of Job to understand what's going on. Because again, this is another thing that people have got this idea, they've got an image of, well, it's Job. You know, this is a Job situation, isn't it? Where someone righteous is being uh, allowed to be attacked by Yah. 
Well, that wasn't the situation with Job. And understanding Job allows us to understand Hastan more as well, which is interesting. So the first verse of Job says, There was a man in the land of Ruth whose name was Eov, and that man was perfect and straight, and one who feared Elohim and turned aside from evil. Okay? So people have got this idea of Job that he was this perfect guy. He was completely righteous before Yah. This word that's translated as perfect here is actually tam. Okay, and it's used of someone else as well. It's used of Jacob. It says, And Asaph became a man knowing how to hunt, a man of the field, while Yaakov was a tam man, a complete man or a perfect man dwelling in tents. And if there's one thing that we know about Jacob, it was that he was not sinless. So what it's saying about Job is not that he was perfect in that he was sinless. We also know the righteousness of Elohim is through faith in Yeshua Messiah to all and on all who believe there is no difference. Okay, so the righteousness that Job had was his faith. We know this also about Job from this. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of Elohim. So Job was not sinless. There was only one sinless person. So Job, although he uh, was a moral person, although he followed Yehovah, he was not sinless. Uh, Job 1, 6 to 8 says, And the day came to be that the sons of Elohim came to pre- present themselves before Yehovah, and Hasatan also came among them. Okay, so Hasatan comes before Yehovah. And Yehovah said to uh, Hasatan, From where do you come? And Hasatan answered Yehovah and said, From diligently searching in the earth and from walking up and down in it. What's Hasatan diligently searching for in the earth? It's an interesting question. We'll look at that in a second. And Yehovah said to Hasatan, Have you considered my servant Eov that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and straight man, one who fears Elohim and turns aside from evil? And this verse, this translation of the verse has caused so much misunderstanding. Have you considered Job? Look, here's Job over here. He's doing really well. You're looking for someone to trouble in the earth. Have you considered Job, perhaps? Maybe he would be a good idea. That's not what the verse says, but we'll see what it says in a second. First, let's look at 1 Peter 5 to 8. It says, Be sober, watch, because your adversary, the devil, walks about. What did he say he was doing? Walking about on the earth like a, lo- uh, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So he said he was seeking in the earth. He was walking up and down in the earth. So this is what he was doing. He was seeking someone on the earth to devour. And this is what Yehovah answers him. Yehovah saith unto the adversary, okay, literally the adversary, Hasatan, doesn't say Satan in the Hebrew, it says the adversary. This is the Young's literal translation. Yehovah saith unto the adversary, Hast thou set thy heart against my servant Job, because there is none like him in the land? Very different, isn't it? Okay, you've been walking up and down on the earth, seeking someone to devour, and Yehovah says to him, Have you set your heart on Job? Job's a good guy. This is what Hasatan answers. Hasatan answered Yehovah and said, Is a Yob fearing Elohim for naught? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand, please, and strike all that he has if he would not curse you to your face. Yehovah said to Hasatan, See, all that he has is in your hand. Only do not lay a hand on himself. And Hasatan went out from the presence of Yehovah. So what's Hasatan doing at this point? Why is he allowed to trouble Job? Well, we're told this. Revelation 12.10 says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the deliverance and the power and the reign of, reign of our Elohim, the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers who accused them before Elohim night and day, which is what we see Hasatan doing here, has been thrown down. So Hasatan will accuse us. We get another little insight into how it works with Hasatan from Yeshua. And the master said, Shimon, Shimon, Peter, Peter, see, Hasatan has asked for you to sift you as wheat. Okay, just like with Job here as well. But I have prayed for you that your belief should not fail. Okay, so Hasatan comes with an accusation. And his accusation about Job is basically... It's all right for Job, isn't it, when everything's going smoothly? But test Job a bit, and you're going to see what's really in Job. Yeshua says, I've prayed for you that your belief should not fail. 
And when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Master, I am prepared to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said to you, I say to you, Kepha, the cock shall not crow at all today until you have denied three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out without a purse and bag and sandals, did you lack any? And they said, none at all. This is going to raise another issue now. So he says that Hasatan wants to sift Peter. Okay. He tells him, basically, you're going to fail the test. You're going to deny that you knew me three times. Okay. Now I come to this. It says, he said, when I sent you without purse and bag and sandals, did you lack any? And they said, none at all. And he said to them, but now let him who has a purse take it. Likewise also a bag and let him who has no sword sell his garment and buy one. And I want to deal with this while we're going through it because I've seen multiple people recently saying, when Yeshua said, go out and buy a sword, he was telling everyone to go out and get armed. Everyone should have a sword, basically. But is that what Yeshua was doing? Okay, do, do we have the right to all go out and buy guns for self-defense, for example? For I say to you that what has been written has yet to be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned with lawless ones. For that which refers to me has an end too. So why did he want him to have a sword? He wanted him to have a sword so that it was fulfilled he was reckoned with lawless ones. How did them having swords mean that he was reckoned with lawless ones? Well, when the high priest's servant came, Peter cut off his ear, didn't he? Okay, so Yeshua was found with the lawless ones. That's why they had to have swords. He says, because that which refers to me has an end too. There's a purpose in this. It has to be fulfilled. And they said, Master, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, that is enough. He doesn't go, two swords? Are you having a laugh? There's the Roman Empire out there. Go and get loads of swords and get loads more people as well and we'll all have swords and then we'll be able to defend ourselves. It's not what he's talking about. Okay, he's saying, look, two swords is fine. If you had one sword, it's fine. Just give it to Peter. And coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives according to usage, according to his uh, custom. And his disciples also followed him. And coming to the place, he said to them, pray that you do not enter into trial. Now these things are just kind of they're just in there and we kind of read over them. Perhaps you don't really understand what's going on here. But he said to Peter, I've prayed for you that your belief does not uh, fail. And he tells them, he advises them, pray that you don't enter into trial. Because Hasatan is called the trier, okay, the one who will bring the trial. Often called the tempter, but really what, it, what that word means to tempt in the King James English is to try, to try somebody. Pray that you do not enter into trial. We also see him advising that we pray this very thing in the Lord's Prayer. It says, and do not lead us into trial, but deliver us from the wicked one. Now, I don't know about the people here, but it's not been an incredibly common prayer of mine that Yah would not lead me into trial. I mean, maybe some people pray that. I would say that since Yeshua is quite insistent on this, he even puts it in the Lord's Prayer, that we should probably all take it on board and start praying. Please don't lead us into trial. Okay? Deliver us from the wicked one. Deliver us from Hasatan, from the tempter. So back to Job. Verse 13 says, And the day came to be when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their brother, the firstborn. And a messenger came to Job and said that oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding alongside them. And when Shiva, sorry, when Shiva fell upon them and took them away and they smote the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to inform you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of Elohim fell from the heavens, burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to inform you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them away. And they smote the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to inform you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their brother, the firstborn. And see, a great wind came from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young men, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to inform you. And Job takes this pretty well. It says, then Job rose up, tore his robe, shaved his head, he fell to the ground and did obeisance, and said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I returned there. Yehovah has given and Yehovah has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yehovah. So what happened? 
He was tested and the material things that he had in this world, things that meant things to him, were taken from him. Job passes this test. He says, blessed be the name of Yehovah. He's taken away the things that he gave me. That's fine. Doesn't end there though. In all this, Yehov did not sin nor ascribe wrongdoing unto Elohim. Okay, so ascribing wrongdoing unto Elohim is something that our attention is drawn to here. And regrettably, it's where Job goes after this. In Job 2, 3 to 6, it says, And Yehovah said to Satan, Have you set your heart against my servant, Ayov? Because none is like him on the earth, a perfect and straight man, one who fears Elohim and turns aside from evil. And still he holds fast to his integrity, and you move, it, move me against him to destroy him without cause. And Hasatan answered Yehovah and said, Skin for skin, and all that a man has he would give for his life. But stretch out your hand, please, and strike his bone and his flesh, if he would not curse you to your face. So he accuses him again. Satan comes as the accuser before him. He's like, okay, so you take certain things from Job and he's not bothered about those things. Where it's really going to hurt with Job is if you take away his health. If you take away his health, it's really going to hurt there. He'll curse you to your face, in fact. Yelvah said to Hasatan, see is in your hand, only spare his life. So what's happening here? Hasatan is coming with an accusation against Job, an accusation that turns out to be true, just like the accusation against Peter turned out to be true. And Yehovah says, okay, you've got authority to do things in Job's life, but it was Yehovah that granted these things. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, let the day perish on which I was born, and the night it was said the male child has been conceived. Why does he give light to the sufferer and life to the bitter of soul? He's starting to question Yahweh at this point. Who are waiting for death, where it does not come, and search for it more than treasures. Who rejoice exceedingly, they are glad when they find the grave. Why does he give light to a man whose way has been hidden, whom Meloa has hedged in? Job's friends respond to him and say, See, you've instructed many, and you've made weak hands strong. Your words have raised up him who was stumbling, and you've strengthened the weak knees. But now it's come to you, and you're impatient. It strikes you, and you're troubled. It's not reverence, your trust, the integrity of ways, your expectancy. So, Job, it's all about this when it came to Yehovah. Okay? Tell everyone, have, have faith in Yehovah. And through that, he had given strength to these people who were going through trials. Job gets a trial, though. Now it's come to that person, they're impatient, okay? Strikes them and they're troubled, okay? Again, these things repeat all the way throughout history. It's not reverence your trust, really. It's not reverence your trust. The trials come upon you. You're not trust in your reverence for Yehovah. The integrity of ways, your expectancy, you expect that if you are walking in integrity that you'll be okay with Yehovah, that he has a purpose in these things. Job 5.17 says, Look, blessed is the man whom Eloah does reprove. Okay, again, great advice. Blessed is the man that uh, Eloah, Elohim, does reprove. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. These are the things that his friends are advising him. Does Job go, you're right, you're right, you know what, I just need to have faith. Actually, Job says, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity be placed on the scales. If only you could understand how hard it was. My calamity, oh, that it was thoroughly weighed and I could give you a, a measurement for how great my grief was. Then you'd understand. For it would outweigh the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words have been rash. I spoke these words, but I was justified in speaking them. And it was because my calamity has been so great before Elohim. He says, teach me and I shall be silent and show me where I have gone astray. Words of brightness are harsh, but what does your reproving reprove? So he's saying to his friends who are coming with sound biblical advice, he's saying, these, these words are harsh. What do you expect to tell me these things? Do you reckon to reprove my words? The sayings of one in despair? Okay. I'm crushed. And you're coming to me and you're telling me all of this stuff. Can't you see how crushed I am? How emotionally destroyed I am. And you're coming and you're telling me the words of Elohim. What, what good is it going to do? You're telling somebody who's not in a position to receive these words. 
Am I the sea or a sea monster that you set a guard over me, says Job? When I say my bed does not comfort me, my couch, uh, sorry, when I say my bed does comfort me and my couch does ease my complaint, then you frighten me with dreams and make me afraid with visions. I think it's interesting that he says this because who is it that's coming against him? Is it Yehovah directly? It's Hasatan that's doing this. Frightening him with dreams and making him afraid with visions. So it would seem from this, this is only one point of evidence, I might be wrong, but that Hasatan can influence dreams as well. So that my soul does uh, choose a strangling death rather than my bones. I have wasted the way I would not live forever. Leave me alone for my days of a breath. What is man that you should make him great? You should set your heart on him. That you should visit him every morning, trying him every moment. You hear how he's speaking about Yah now. Why is man that you would do this? How could you do this? How long do you not look away from me nor leave me alone till I swallow my saliva? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, a watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to you? Okay, so is Job's attitude perfect before Yehovah? Or was the accusation that Hasatan brought against him, in fact, correct? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I lie down in the dust and you shall seek me, but I am not. Okay. If I've sinned against you, why have you, fin- why have you not forgiven me? Is this punishment just? Are you ever going to leave me alone? Even if I say that in sleep I have comfort, you send terrifying dreams against me. If I am righteous, my mouth would declare me wrong. Am I perfect? It would declare me perverse. Am I perfect? Do I not know my own soul? I despise my life. Man's innocency is not to be condemned by afflictions. So again, he's saying here, he's claiming his innocence. It is all the same. Therefore, I say he destroys the perfect and the wicked. Now he's really bringing some uh, slander against Jehovah's character. If the scourge slays suddenly, he laughs at the trial of the innocent. Earth has been given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of its judges. If it's not he, then who is it? Then so far the the Naamathite answered and said, should the multitude of words go unanswered and should a man of lips be declared right? You think you're you're saying all this stuff. Is that going to be, you know, is that your defense? The fact that you've got loads of stuff to say and you've got all of these accusations against Jehovah. Should your babbling silence men and should you mock and and uh, no one make you ashamed? Since you have said my discourse is flawless and I've been clean in your eyes. Has it really been flawless? You've really been clean in his eyes? Listen to all the things you're saying. Because of the multitude of oppressions, they cry out. They cry for help because of the arm of the many. Okay, so he says, look, even the innocent, he punishes the innocent. Then, something comes against them and an explanation for what's actually going on. This is the explanation from the mouth of a man. This isn't the explanation from the mouth of Yehovah yet. Yehovah doesn't justify himself to him. He basically says, shut up, Job. You don't know what you're talking about. And no one says, where is Eloah, my maker, who gives songs in the night, teaching us more than the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the heavens? There they cry, but he answers not because of the pride of evil ones. Only it is false that Ael does not hear and that the Almighty pays no attention to it. Although you say you do not see him, yet judgment is before him and you wait for him. Okay? Although you say, although you speak, you do not see him. Okay? You speak, but you don't understand Yehovah. To see is to understand in the scriptures. So although you talk about him, you don't understand him. And Job actually confirms this himself later. He says, and now, is it for naught that his displeasure has come? Yet he has, not taken, he has not taken note of extreme arrogance. Okay, so if Elohim is not responding to these things, it's not because he doesn't hear. It's because he's got a reason for it. So a Job opens his mouth in vain. He increases words without knowledge. Then Yehovah answered a Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Should a reprover contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves the lower answer it. And he answered the over and said, See, I am insignificant. What would I answer you? I lay, a, I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, 
but I have no answer and twice, but I say no more. So he doesn't repent at this point. He doesn't recognize that he's doing wrong. All he does is he go, he goes, yeah, fair enough, yeah, I won't say anything. What can I, what can I answer you? It, by the time it gets around to uh, Job 42 though, it says, and he answered Yehovah and said, you know that you are able to do all. Okay, this is after he says basically, who are you to come before me? You don't understand any of these things, the power of my might, what I've brought to pass. You're not going to understand my schemes. You know that you are able to do all and that no purpose is withheld from you. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I declared, but I did not understand. Okay, you say, but you do not see. I declared, but I did not understand. Matters too marvelous for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. I ask you, then would you make it known to me? I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Okay? I had an intellectual understanding of these things before. I intellectually understood that we were to just have faith and we were to walk out trials and all the rest of it. I knew that. I, I shared that with everyone. But now my eye sees it because I've actually experienced it myself. Therefore, I despise myself and repent. And this is the position that Yehovah was bringing Job to. He had the purpose in all of it. He used Hasatan as his pawn. He knew the end from the beginning. He knew everything that was going to play out. And he does the same with the spirit realm, which we'll look at in the subsequent parts. Psalm 94, 12 to 15 says, Blessed is the man you discipline, O Yah, and instruct out of your Torah, to give him rest from the days of evil until the pit is dug for the wrong. For Yahuwah does not leave his people, nor does he forsake his inheritance. For judgment returns man to righteousness, and all the upright in heart follow it. So Job was upright in heart, okay? And the judgment returned him to his righteousness, okay? He disciplined somebody. Why? Just to smite them? No, to give them rest from the days of evil, to return them to righteousness, and Yehovah blessed the latter days of Yehov more than his beginning. Okay, blessed is the man you discipline. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys, and he had seven sons and three daughters. Okay, and in part three and part four, we're going to look further into the spiritual realm so that we can understand these things. But this is a good baseline for us to understand those things from. Now that this is cemented in our heads, we can understand those things. Okay, so where we're at, what we've looked at basically is that if you're in the word, then you're protected by Yehovah. If you give Hasatan an excuse to have something to accuse you of before Yehovah, maybe you will uh, come under temptation or come under trial from Hasatan. So now what we're going to look at is spiritual warfare. Okay, it's a f it's a phrase, isn't it, that's bandied about all over the place, spiritual warfare. And people have a different idea of what spiritual warfare actually is because we know what actual warfare is. So when we think of spiritual warfare, we think that it's going to correlate to it somehow. But spiritual warfare is not actually that at all. Ephesians 6.12 says, Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. Now, it says that we wrestle against those things, but it's not talking about, again, having a fight with them, even on the spiritual realm, okay? Uh, James 1, 13 to 16 says, let no one say when he is enticed, I am enticed by Elohim. For Elohim is not enticed by evil, and he entices no one. And this picture actually just looks like smoke coming from the Bible, doesn't it? So that's what the picture actually is. It's, it's the spirit. It represents the spirit. But each one is enticed when he is drawn away by his own desires and trapped. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has been accomplished, it brings forth death. Okay, so Yehovah uses these spiritual powers and he uses them to tempt us. Sometimes he will use them as a means to deceive us, to see whether we'll buy the deception. But no one is actually tempted or enticed by Yehovah himself. 
or by these entities. They will come with things that might entice us, where it's telling us that the enticement comes from what is inside us, okay, by his own desires. Do not go astray, my beloved brothers. Okay, so when these things come against us, these spiritual powers, it's actually what's inside of us that they're playing against. The word for wrestle, okay, it's only used once in the Greek New Testament. It says wrestle also in the Aramaic, if anybody's wondering. Okay, wrestling a contest between two in which each endeavors to throw the other and which is decided when the victor is able to hold his opponent down with his hand upon his neck. This was the form of wrestling that they would have been referring to at the time. But in the figurative sense that it's used, the term is transferred to the Christian struggle with the power of evil. So what is the power of evil? Okay, there's these entities that will come. They will entice you. Okay, but it's only working on what's within you. And that's where the real spiritual battleground for, if you want to use those terms, is. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 to 6 says, And I, Shaul, myself appeal to you. Through the meekness and gentleness of Messiah, I who am indeed lowly when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. But I pray that when I am present, I might not be bold with that bravery by which I think to be bold against some who reckon us as if we walk according to the flesh. What's he saying? Basically saying, listen, you don't want me to be bold with the same boldness when I'm there. Probably wouldn't be good. That's the boldness that I think to be bold with. He's admitting in his mind that he thinks to be physically violent, basically. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. Okay? But he has the thought to do this. Because obviously these people, we were talking about it in the break, the Corinthians, he didn't uh, very highly uh, esteem them in his own estimation. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim. And now he's going to tell us about these weapons for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings, and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim. Okay, so this that he's describing here is a reasoning or a high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim from Scripture. He says, taking thought, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah. So he's saying, I've had this thought, but we don't fight fleshly. This thought can be dealt with in the spiritual realm. He says, these reasonings, these high matters, we take them captive, make it obedient to the Messiah, being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Okay, so this is, a little bit of a pigment in the picture of uh, spiritual warfare, what it involves. First Peter 2.11 says, Beloved ones, I appeal to you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts. Okay, this is what it's all about, fleshly lusts, which battle against the soul. And as I said before, the soul and the spirit are bound up together so that only the word of Elohim could cause division of the two. Battle against the soul. Galatians 5.17 says, The flesh lusts against the spirit. Which is what Peter's talking about here when he says these fleshly lusts battle against the soul. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. This is where the spiritual battleground is. These are opposed to each other so that you do not do what you desire to do. Ephesians 6.10-20 should now make more sense in light of this. For the rest, my brothers, be strong in the master and in the mightiness of his strength. Put on the complete armor of Elohim for you to have power to stand against the schemes of the devil. They're mentioned again here, Hasatan schemes. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. These spiritual entities. Again, what do they come to us with? They come to us with temptations. Why are they tempting to us? We're tempted. We're enticed by the lusts of the flesh. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood beings, but ironically, we do wrestle against the flesh. Okay? Because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim so that you have power to withstand in the wicked day and having done all to stand. Okay, so how will we have power to withstand the schemes of Hasatan? By putting on the armor of Elohim. Stand then, having girded your waist with truth. Okay, your word is truth. Your Torah is truth. Okay, so this is part of 
what we armor ourselves with. And as we go through this, as we've seen before, all of these elements are the word of Elohim. That is the armor that we put on. Because remember, if we are under Yah's protection and we're following the word, then the evil one cannot touch us. We have power to stand against his schemes. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, okay, all your commands are righteousness. Again, we've, we've seen this before, but these are the components. It's all the word. Having fitted your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace, not the washed down, watered down Christian gospel, okay, the gospel that was preached to the Israelites, that they had been released from Egypt, they'd been delivered from Egypt, then they were given the Torah and they could be Um, Elohim's people and he would be their Elohim. That's the good news that we've got. We've been released from that by which we were bound and now we can walk uh, in obedience to Elohim having made repentance. True gospel. Above all, having taken up the shield of belief with which you have power to quench all the burning arrows of the wicked one. Okay, if you're walking in faith, you're walking in belief, you're walking in the word of Elohim, then the wicked one cannot touch you. Take also the helmet of deliverance. Again, deliverance, same word, salvation, often translated salvation. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim. Okay, so all of these, both your armor, your defense, and your weapon are the word of Elohim. And if you've got those, then you can stand against the wicked one. A spiritual battle is happening between the spirit and the flesh. If you clothe yourself in the word of Elohim, you are walking in the spirit and you conquer the flesh. Also, something uh, that perhaps we've not focused on before, but another element that he mentions here with the armor, praying at all times with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Okay, this is, again, part of the armor of Elohim. Watching in all perseverance and supplication for all the set apart ones. Also for me that a word might be given to me in the opening of my mouth to be bold in making known the secret of the good news for which I am an envoy in chains that in it I might speak boldly as I should speak. Okay, so he says, pray for me basically. Pray for me that I might speak boldly in the deliverance of the word for people. We get a lot of people who will get in touch and they'll say, um, you know, we pray for you guys all the time. We pray for the people at the fellowship all the time. I would ask for anybody who's watching online that you pray for this, for Charlie and I, that we might be bold in delivering the word to people. Ephesians 5, 6 to 13 obviously comes directly before Ephesians 6. And when we link it together with the scripture that we're going to see afterwards, we see what the armor of Elohim is and how it relates to this. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these, the wrath of Elohim comes upon the sons of disobedience. Okay, so one of the ways, one of the schemes of Hasatan is that people will come and they'll deceive you with empty words, okay, to cause you to be disobedient. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the master. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth okay so all the way through this he's talking about these same elements following the word of elohim and then he goes on to describe it as the armor of elohim proving what is well pleasing to the master okay that's uh to prove something is to test it as well as to show the evidence for something okay you do these things it's axiomatic that means it's self-proving you do it and it proves itself Have no fellowship with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove the fruitless works of darkness. How do we do that? For it is a shame to even speak of what is done by them in secret. Okay, so don't speak of what they're doing in secret. It doesn't concern us. All matters being reproved are manifested by the light. So how do we reprove them? Okay, we manifest it by the light. For whatever is manifested is light. You need light to make something manifest so that you can see it. Now we can see the link to the armor of Elohim here. And do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for us to wake up from our sleep. For now our deliverance is nearer than when we did believe. Our salvation is nearer than when we did believe. When we believed, we were saved. We were cleansed of our sin. However, at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah, we might be found to uh, esteem and honor and glory. Okay, that's the second salvation event. 
That is nearer than when we first did believe and we were cleansed of our sins. The night is far advanced. The day has come near. So let us put off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. This is what he's talking about here when he says, walk in the light, walk as children of the light. Then you will defeat the darkness with this. And then he goes on in Ephesians to talk about the armor of Elohim. It's the same thing, the armor of light. Let us walk becomingly. Okay, again, it's about your works, what you're doing. What the armor of Elohim is to walk in the word. As in the day, not in wild parties and drunkenness, not in living together in indecencies, not in fighting and envy. But put on Master Yeshua Messiah and make for no provision. Again, what is this spiritual battle? What's it about? Make no provision for the lusts of the flesh. Put on the armor of Elohim. Put on Yeshua Messiah. Put on the light. Put on the armor of light. It's the word of Elohim. All of this is talking about the word of Elohim. But what will the word of Elohim protect us against? What's it a defense against? The lusts of the flesh. This is where the true spiritual battle is. Genesis 4, 6-7 says, And Yehovah said to Cain, Why are you wrath and why is your face fallen? If you do well, is there not acceptance? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should master it. Okay, so we've got the outline of spiritual warfare all the way from Genesis. Sin's desire is for you, but you should master sin. Okay, sin is in the flesh. There's no good that dwells in the flesh, as Paul says, which we'll look at in a second. Rather walk in the spirit. Master sin. That's spiritual warfare for you. Paul talks about it in Romans 7. He says, for we know that the Torah is spiritual. Okay, the law of Elohim, the armor of Elohim, the armor of light, whatever you want to call it, being clothed in Messiah, whatever phrases people want to use. The Torah is spiritual and the Torah fights in that realm. But I'm fleshly sold under sin. For what I work, I know not. For what I wish, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. But if I do what I do not wish, I agree with the Torah that it is good. In other words, if you don't want to do something, then you don't want to do it because you're agreeing that it's not a good thing to do. And now it is no longer I that work it, but the sin dwelling in me. Okay, sin will crouch at your door. Its desire will be for you, but you should master it. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good. For to wish is present with me, but to work the good I do not find. Okay, so if you walk in the flesh, you're not going to be able to do the Torah. The best that you can hope for is that you're going to agree that the Torah is good, but you're going to be ineffective in walking in it. For the good that I wish to do, I do not do, but the evil I do not wish to do, this I practice. And if I do that which I do not wish, it is no longer I who work it, but the sin dwelling in me. Okay, so it's his flesh, not the spirit. The spirit, as he calls it, the inward man, agrees with the Torah. I find therefore this law that when I wish to do the good that the evil is present with me. For I delight in the Torah of Elohim according to the inward man. And as we've seen before, the inward man is the spirit. They are equated in all the scriptures. But I see another law in my members battling against the Torah of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thanks to Elohim that through Yeshua Messiah, our master, so then with the mind I myself truly serve the Torah of Elohim, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Okay, and Charlie's looked at, I think it was last week when he looked at the heart and the mind being the same. Where does the spirit dwell? It's in the heart of man. Who knows the heart of man but a man's spirit? There is the... Uh, there is then no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yeshua who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Okay, again, this is the warfare that the spirit is engaged in. It's against the flesh. The flesh is what strives against the spirit. Not the spiritual entities directly. They come and they play on the things in our flesh that they can entice us by. The desires that are within, which as we'll see, come from the flesh. For the Torah of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has set me free from the Torah of sin and death. Same Torah. The Torah is either the Torah of sin and death to you when it's written on a heart of stone and you know that you should be doing things but you're not doing them and you can't work out how you're meant to do it because you're walking in the flesh. It's the Torah of sin and death to you then. The Torah of life of the spirit 
the life in Messiah Yeshua is when you walk in according to the Spirit and you're actually doing this, the Torah, then it brings life. It's either going to bring you life or it's going to bring you death. For the Torah being powerless in that it was weak through the flesh, Elohim having his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin, condemns sin in the flesh. So that the righteousness of the Torah should be completed in us who walk, um, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So did he come and condemn sin in the flesh so that we could then go on and continue to sin? No, he did that so that the righteousness of the Torah would be completed in us. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the matters of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the matters of the spirit. So we've got the carnal mind and the spiritual mind here. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind of the flesh is enmity towards Elohim. It does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. Neither indeed is it able. Those who are in the flesh are unable to please Elohim. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of Elohim dwells in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, this one is not his. Okay, so a very easy way to tell whether someone belongs to Messiah or not. Okay, whether they've been born of Elohim, he who does righteousness is born of Elohim. Okay, if the spirit which causes you to be subject to the Torah of Elohim is not in somebody, they are none of his. And if Messiah is in you, the body is truly dead on account of sin, but the spirit is life on account of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Messiah from the dead shall also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit dwelling in you. So then, brothers, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. Okay, again, this is spiritual warfare. Okay, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Yeshua gives us the model for, you, for spiritual warfare, how it's to be fought. John 1 verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and pitched this tent among us. Okay. Now Hebrews 4, 14 to 15 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in all respects as we are, apart from sin. And we've looked at this in a different context before. How was Yeshua, who was Elohim in the flesh, the word of Elohim, which is Elohim, how was he able to be tempted? Okay. So we've seen before, it's because he came in flesh. He was, you know, the flesh has evil desires. The sin is in the flesh. Its desire is towards us, but we should master it. So he gives us the way that we are to fight the spiritual warfare. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by Elohim. Elohim's not tempted by evil matters and he tempts no one. So according to the inward man, Yeshua was not tempted. The desires came from his flesh though. It says each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own evil desires and trapped. Was it Yeshua's inward man's evil desires? It was the desires of the flesh. I say walk in the spirit and you shall not accomplish the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are opposed to each other so that you do not do what you desire to do. Yeshua gave us the model though. He walked by the spirit, so he did not do what he did not desire to do. He mastered sin. Romans 7, 17 to 18, and it is no longer I that work it, but the sin dwelling in me. So is it the word of Elohim that was working it, or was it the flesh? Is it the sin dwelling in him where these evil desires came from? For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good. And Yeshua was not immune to this. He came in the flesh. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So the lust of the flesh is not of the Father. Okay? It's of the world. It's of the flesh. And therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and greed of gain which is idolatry. Why? We do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in all respects as we are, keep heart here, apart from sin. 
So he came in the flesh so that he could understand, so that he could sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in every respect as we are. He had all of the lust of the flesh, but he did not sin. It gives us the model for us because people commonly, commonly say, it's too hard. I had to sin in that moment. I had to sin. It's too high. I couldn't have possibly resisted. You sure? He was tempted in every regard as we are. Apart from he didn't sin. This command which I'm commanding you today is not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. Okay? It is going to be spiritual battle, if you want to use those words. However, it's not too hard for us to win the spiritual battle. The Torah being powerless in that it was weak through the flesh, Elohim having his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh concerning sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He mastered the desires of sin. The Torah is weak if you're in the flesh when you're trying to follow it. Okay, if you're in the spirit and you are winning the spiritual warfare, then it is not too hard. First Timothy 3.16 says, And beyond all question, the secret of reverence is great. God was manifest in the flesh, okay, where the evil desire, the sin, dwelt, but declared right in the spirit. This is spiritual warfare. That's how you win spiritual warfare. So we're told that these people exist. Don't think they, they look like this, okay? But these evil entities exist and they will come to us. So we know also that there is a spiritual warfare which happens and it happens in the spiritual realm. Okay, so when we speak of spiritual warfare, the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in is completely different. All it basically consists of is put on the armor of Elohim. Just walk according to the flesh and the evil one will not touch you. Uh, walk according to the spirit and the evil one will not touch you. Okay, but spiritual warfare does happen on this realm. And as we're going through the spiritual world, I can't not acknowledge this. Okay, so some examples. Revelation 12, 7 to 9, they came to be fighting in the heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. They fought. This was a battle that was happening in the heavens. But they were not strong enough, nor was a place found for them in the heaven any longer. And the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old called the devil, and Hasatan, who leads all the world astray. He was thrown to the earth, and his angels were thrown out with him. He brings us back to the idea of Yehovah is not defeated by these things. Just because they've got an army and just because they fight doesn't mean that it's a problem for him to fight. There's not an instance of Yehovah ever fighting against these things where you know, he, he's in trouble or he might not have won. Kind of like if you think about it, the, the world uh, has this spiritual problem, has these evil spiritual entities in it, but Yehovah can send out his shock troops, his angels, and they will win. If you think about it like a riot, okay, there's a riot and there's loads of people rioting everywhere. The government sends out riot police or it sends out the army. They do go and fight against the rioters, but it's never a case of, that was it. That was a close call, wasn't it? Okay, they, they know that they're going to win. But these things are necessary to achieve Yehovah's ends. The prince of Persia would stub me 21 days. So this is the angel Gabriel. Okay, prince of Persia would stub me 21 days. And see, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So again, we see this fighting happening in the spiritual realm. And he said, do you know why I've come to you? And now I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have left, see, the prince of Grisha shall come. So these things are happening all around us. Our eyes are just not open to them. But this is not the spiritual warfare that we are engaged in. People get the two very much mixed up. Blur the lines between the two. Psalm 18 is just something that I want to read before we end. Okay? David was a man who fought spiritual warfare. And often you'll see these things in the Old Testament. Okay, and they are, people say, don't they? they? They were concealed in the Old Testament. They're revealed in the New Testament. But when you read the, the language that David uses here, he's talking about putting on the armor of Elohim. He even uses phrases that Paul draw, uh, draws from. He says, I love you, O Yehovah, my strength. Yehovah is my rock and my stronghold and my deliverer. My ale is my rock. I take refuge in him. My shield and the horde of my deliverance, my high tower. I call upon Yehovah, the one to be praised, and I am safe from my enemies. 
The cords of Sheol surrounded me, and the floods of Beli Al made me afraid. The cords of Sheol were all around me. The snares of death were before me. In my distress, I called upon Yahuwah, and to my Elohim I cried, and he heard my voice from his temple, and my cry went up before him into his ears. Okay, well, part of the armor of Elohim was prayer, wasn't it? Prayer and supplication. The earth shook and trembled. Even the foundations of the mountains were troubled, and they shook because he was wroth. Smoke went up from his nostrils and consuming fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. And he bowed the heavens and came down and thick darkness was under his, under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering around him, his booth, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed, hail and coals of fire. And Yehovah thundered in the heavens and the Most High sent forth his voice. Hail and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them and much lightning and confused them. And the channels of waters were seen and the foundations of the world were uncovered at your rebuke, O Yehovah. At the blast of the breath of your nostrils, we see Elisha praying that these people will be blinded. Okay, here we see the confusion that comes upon them, the same sort of confusion that comes upon them when uh, Gideon goes with his, just with his trumpets and his um, torches of fire. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those hating me, for they were stronger than I. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but Yehovah was my support. And he brought me out into a large place. Again, he delivered me because he delighted in me. Why was David under this protection? It was because he was wearing the armor of Elohim as he goes through now. He says, Yehovah rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He repaid me. So he's quoting from when he says it in Second Samuel that we saw before. For I have guarded the ways of Yehovah and I have not acted wrongly against my Elohim. For all his judgments, his mishpatim are before me and I did not turn from his laws, from his chukot. I am, before, I, I am before him and I guard myself from my iniquity. What did it say? It said that the one who does not sin guards himself and the wicked one does not touch him. And Yehovah repays me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands before his eyes. With the kind, you show yourself kind. With the perfect one, you show yourself perfect. With the clean, you show yourself clean. And with the crooked, you shall turn aside from. The Masoretic text, it says, with the crooked, you show yourself perverse. Never, never really sat right with me. The Septuagint says this, with the crooked, you shall turn away from. For you, show, for you save the afflicted people, but bring down those whose eyes are haughty. For you yourself light my lamp. Yehovah, my Elohim, makes my darkness light. You can see these things that Paul is drawing from. The armor of light. Okay, wear the armor of Elohim. Put on the armor of Elohim. For with you I run against the band, and with my Elohim I leap over a wall. The Eel, his way is perfect. The word of Yehovah is proven. He is a shield to all those who take refuge in him. For who is a lower beside Yehovah? Who is a rock except our Elohim? It is Eel who girds me with strength and makes my way perfect. He's talking again in very much the same language that Paul is talking, talking in, making my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me on my high places, teaching my hands for battle so that my arm shall bend a bow of bronze. For you give me the shield of your deliverance. It's called the helmet of deliverance in uh, Paul's letters, but it's the same thing. Okay, all of these terms are used interchangeably. It's the shield of faith in uh, Paul's letters. You give me the shield of your deliverance and your right hand supports me and your lowliness makes me great. You enlarge my step under me and my feet shall not slip. I pursue my enemies and overtake them and I do not turn back till they are destroyed. I crush them and they are unable to rise. They fall at my feet and you gird me with strength for battle because my, cause my adversaries to bow under me, bow under me. And you have made my enemies turn their backs. As for those hating me, I cut them off. They cry, but no one is there to save. To Yehovah, but he answers them not. I beat them as dust before the wind. I empty them out like dirt in the streets. You deliver me from the strivings of the people. You set me at the head of nations, a people I have not known. Serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me. The foreigners submit to me. 
The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their strongholds. Yehovah lives and blessed is my rock and exalted is the Elohim of my deliverance, of my salvation, my Yeshua. The ale who avenges me and he humbles the peoples under me. My deliverance from my enemies, you lift me up above those who rise against me. You deliver me from a man of violence. Therefore, I give thanks to you, O Yehovah, among the nations, and I sing praise to your name, making great the deliverance of his king and showing kindness to his anointed, to David and his seed forever. So all of the things that we've looked at, whether it's physical human enemies coming against against us, or whether it's esteem in the eyes of man, favor in the eyes of man, it all comes from the same source. It's all this spiritual warfare, true spiritual warfare, which is wearing the armor of Elohim and is walking in the word. So before we push on and we look at deliverance ministry and that element of the spiritual realm, I want to take a break here so that it's not just like one big long part that everyone's just exhausted by the end of. Okay, take a short break. Okay, so the first principle that we looked at was if there is no sin in our lives, the evil one cannot touch us. And that matches up with what we looked at in the last part, which is if you wear in the armor of Elohim, in other words, if there's no sin in your life, the evil one cannot touch you. And it says that we struggle against those entities. But our struggle, as we saw, is with the flesh. Those entities come and they entice us, but it's according to our flesh. It's our flesh that allows them to do that. But we're not enticed by anything outside of the lust of our flesh. So that struggle is with them, but when they're coming with a, um, with a temptation, and that comes from the lust of our flesh, so the battleground truly lies between the spirit and the flesh. This part I want to look at real spiritual attacks. People talk about spiritual attacks all the time, don't they? And you know, this picture is to represent uh, sleep paralysis. And this is a real thing that happens. It's an example of what I was talking about before. Not a deceptive spirit, a demonic spirit, okay? A mischievous spirit, okay? And people do experience things like that. They shouldn't be if they're walking in the Word. If anyone's experiencing anything like this, people who are watching online, then again, it's Yehovah just giving you a gentle nudge and saying, there's a problem here. There's a problem. You're vulnerable to being attacked. Okay, basic principle. Everyone being born of Elohim doesn't sin. The one having been born of Elohim guards himself by not sinning. He protects himself. The wicked one does not touch him. Basic truth is true. Anyone suffering anything like that, there's a problem. So spiritual attacks on Yehovah's people take a different form. Again, just like spiritual warfare takes a different form. Okay, deceptive spirits test our defenses. We kind of saw a, a little bit of that before, but we'll look at it more in this part. False prophets or teachers are sent by Yah to test whether we love him. All of these things are under Yah's authority. He knows all of these things. He put all of these institutions, these authorities, these powers, these masteries, he put them all in place from the beginning. Okay, and he uses them for a purpose in our lives. Hasatan will come to us with tests, often using the word by twisting it or taking it out of context. And we'll see that as well. And the armor of Elohim guards us from each of these. Deliverance ministry is the outgrowth of the deception the people's sin is the result of demonic activity. This is something that is uh, prevalent in deliverance ministry. I'm not going to tar all of them with the same brush. Oh. Deliverance ministry as a whole is not a good thing. I'm not saying they all teach this, but people get the idea that if they're sinning, then it's because some kind of demon is making them sin. They need deliverance. I've got a real problem with pornography. I've got a real problem with drugs. I need deliverance. I need deliverance from these things. Rather than, I'm going to fight spiritual warfare and I'm going to overcome these things. Okay? I've, got a, I've got a demon. So it's the lie that sin is the result of demonic activity and not their own rebellion. Now, 1 Kings 22, 2-23 it says, it came to be in the third year that Jehoshaphat, king of Yehudah, came down to the king of Israel. Now, Jehoshaphat was a good king. King of Israel was not a good king. The king of Israel said to his servants, 
Do you know that Ramoth in Gilad is ours and we are keeping silent from taking it out of the hand of the king of Aram? And he said to Jehoshaphat, if you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilad, and Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people is your people, my horses is your horses. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please first inquire for the word of Yehovah. And the king of Israel gathered prophets, about 400 men, and said to them, do I go up against Ramoth Gilad to battle, or do I refrain? And they said, go up, for Yehovah does give it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of Yehovah besides that we might inquire of him? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man, Michyehu, son of Yimla, to inquire of Yehovah by him, but I hate him, because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. So the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring Michyehu, of, uh, Michyehu son of Yimla, at once. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Yehuda, were sitting, each on his throne, dressed in their robes, at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Shomoro in uh, Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. And Zikiah, son of Canaan, had made horns of iron for himself and said, Thus said Yehovah, with these you push the Arameans until they are destroyed. Really going for it. He's actually he's made himself a set of horns. Yehovah said, with these horns you're going to have victory. I can't even imagine the scene. And all the prophets were prophesying so, saying, Go up to a remote Gilad and prosper, for Yehovah shall give it into the hand of the king. And the messenger who had gone to call, Mechiehu, spoke to him, saying, See now the words of the prophets, with one mouth are good towards the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them. You shall speak good. And Michiehu said, As Yehovah lives, whatever Yehovah says to me, that I speak. And he came to the king, and the king said to him, Michiehu, do we go up against remote Gilad to battle, or do we refrain? And he answered him, saying, Go and prosper, for Yehovah shall give it into the hand of the king. And the king said to him, how many times have I made you swear that you do not speak to me except the truth in the name of Yehovah, which I find fascinating. He's got all of these prophets saying, go up to battle, you're going to win. Gets the other guy, he asks him, and he says, go up, you're going to win. And he goes, how many times have I told you to tell me the truth? This guy knows the situation, okay? So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And Yehovah said, these have no master. Let everyone return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, have I not said to you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Then he said, hear the word of Yehovah. I saw Yehovah sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven were standing by him on his right and on his left. And Yehovah said, who shall entice Ahav to go up and fall at remote Gilad? And this one said this, and another said that. And a spirit came forward and stood before Yehovah and said, let me entice him. And Yehovah said to him, in what way? And he said, I shall go out and be a spirit of falsehood in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, entice him and also prevail. Go out and do so. And now see, Yehovah has put a spirit of falsehood in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. And Yehovah has spoken evil concerning you. So again, all of these things are under Yehovah's authority. He sends out this spirit to be a spirit of falsehood to convince these prophets. And he can do this in our lives too. He will send out a deceptive spirit to fulfill his purposes in our life. In Matthew 4 verse 1, we see another type of spiritual attack. It says, then Yeshua was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tried by the devil be tried by him. He is the trier. And the trier came and said to him, if you are the son of Elohim, command that these stones become bread. But he answering said, it has been written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of Yehovah. Okay, so Yeshua shows us how to um, fight spiritual warfare here. When this temptation comes to him and he's tried by this, he quotes scripture. He puts on the entire armor of Elohim, the armor of light. Then we see another while of the devil. It says, Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on the edge of the holy place, and said to him, If you are the son of Elohim, throw yourself down, for it has been written, He shall command his angels concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, so that you do not dash your foot against the stone. Often he will come to us 
with scripture. And it's scripture that he's taken and he's twisted out of context. Okay, which is why we are to be armored in the entire word of Elohim, the entire counsel of Elohim, not just be led astray by something that sounds good. Yeshua said to him, it has also been written, you shall not try Yahuwah your Elohim. So what does he do again? He uses the word of Elohim for his defense. Matthew 4, 8 to 11 says, again the devil took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these I shall give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said to him, Go, Satan, for it has been written, You shall worship Yehovah your Elohim, and him alone you shall serve. So Yeshua, our model in everything, as Charlie said last week, okay, this is what he does. The word of Elohim is consistent all the way through, whether it's the Psalms, whether it's the letters of Paul, whether it's Yeshua, it's consistent all the way through. Then the devil left him, and see, angels came and attended him. So what did he do? He resisted the devil. The devil left him. So then subject yourselves to Elohim. Put on the armor of Elohim. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. I'd encourage anybody that if you have a temptation in your life and it's really, really hard for you, it's a struggle for you, okay? if you resist that temptation, you will find that it will go from you. In the moment when you're entertaining that you might indulge in whatever it is, it will be really difficult. But if you resist that, and specifically if you do it in the way that Yeshua said to do, or Yeshua modeled for us to do, which is to quote the word of Elohim, because what the trier does is he comes to us with various temptations. But what all of those temptations are is they are lies, okay, because they're against the truth. If what you can do is then show the trier what the truth is, his lies cannot stand up against the truth. So I would say to anybody, get the scriptures, find the ones which pertain to your particular situation that show you what the truth of the situation is. And then when the trier comes with a lie and tries to get you to stray from the truth, you quote the truth to him, you resist him, and that temptation will go. And I've experienced it personally where temptation leaves you it's just, it's just remarkable. It's something supernatural, undeniably supernatural, that it was a temptation to you. You resist it, and then it goes, and you're not even tempted by it anymore. It's incredible. Zechariah 3, 1 to 2 says, And he showed me Yehoshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Yehovah, and Hasatan standing at his right hand to be an adversary to him. In the Hebrew, literally what it says is, the adversary standing at his right hand, Sataning him. <laughs> Satan standing at his right hand, Sataning him. Okay, it's the verb form of being an adversary. It's the verb form of the adversary. So Satan was standing at his right hand, Sataning him. And Yahuwah said to Hasatan, Yahuwah rebuke you, Hasatan. Yahuwah who has chosen Yerushalayim rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Okay, so again. You are in the armor of Elohim. You're walking in the word of Elohim. Yehovah fights for you. The evil one cannot touch you. 1 Peter 1, 5-7 says, Who are protected by the power of Elohim through faith. Okay, what Paul describes is the shield of faith. Okay, just walking in the word of Elohim. You're protected by this, by the power of Elohim, if you walk in faith, if you walk in by the word, for a deliverance, a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And which you exult, even though for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by manifold trials. In order that the proving of your faith, okay, even Yeshua went through the proving of his faith. He was tried in the wilderness. Much more precious than gold that perishes and proven by fire might be found to result in praise and respect and esteem at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. So this tells us that when these tests come, this is what it's to determine whether or not you're going to be found with praise, respect, and esteem when Yeshua is revealed. So when these things come up in their tests, it's not just a case of maybe I'll fail that test, maybe I'll just sin. It's a case of am I going to be found to praise, respect, and esteem at the coming of Yeshua, or am I not? That's the literal decision that you're making in that moment. Okay, so we've got somebody. Okay, this is somebody, one of Yehovah's people who is under the protection of Yehovah. 
Now, to get them to come out from under the protection of Yehovah, as we saw before, deceptive spirits may work. Okay, they come with the deceptions we saw before. Is Yeshua contradicting the Tanakh? Are Paul's letters really Yah's words? We don't have to wear zitzit anymore. We've got the Ruach HaKadosh. Paul taught that the Gentiles shouldn't be circumcised. Okay? So the person comes out from under the protection of Yehovah's word. And then he's just walking through his life with the deceptive spirits. And as we saw before, Yehovah can bring somebody else who is out of the protection of Yehovah's word who will deceive you with the same deceptions that they're deceived by. So somebody who's in Yehovah's word can also be tempted out by somebody who's outside of the protection. It doesn't have to be a deceptive spirit that comes to lure the person out. It can be another Christian who comes with some kind of false doctrine. Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5 speaks about this situation. It says, When there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, then he shall give you a sign or wonder. The sign of wonder shall come true of which he's spoken to you, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and serve them. So even if this person is coming and they seem to have some kind of spiritual power or you know, there's some kind of confirmation that what they're saying is correct, not necessarily from Yehovah in the way that you think. Do not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yehovah your Elohim is trying you to know whether you love Yehovah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. So again, Yehovah is using all of it. He's using all of those things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Walk after Yehovah your Elohim. Fear him, cherish his commands, obey his voice, serve him, cling to him. It doesn't matter what nonsense they come to you with and it doesn't matter how many times it's confirmed. That prophet or that dreamer of dreams is put to death because he has spoken apostasy against Yehovah your Elohim who, made, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim and redeemed you from the house of bondage to make you stray from the way in which Yehovah your Elohim commanded you to walk. Thus you shall purge the evil from your midst. And here we see another example of Yehovah will hold you responsible for going after that person and he'll also hold them responsible uh, for trying to make you go astray. But he will use the whole situation to test you. Okay, so person in the world, okay, and I've been in this situation, can be deceived by deceptive spirits, deceiving them about the nature of the spiritual world. Okay, can make them think all sorts of crazy nonsense, it can give them all sorts of spiritual visions. I've experienced the same things. Okay, dreams can give you dreams, can confirm these things. Okay, and all of them seem trustworthy because they come from an unusual spiritual source. So you think, oh, this is amazing, isn't it? Nobody talks about this sort of stuff. This sort of stuff never happens to people. This must be trustworthy in some way. Okay, I was under the same delusion. These deceptive spirits can make your life a magical thing to experience. You can go through having all of these amazing spiritual experiences. We looked at them when we looked at the idea of being guided by signs and wonders. Okay, just like I was when I was in the world, guided by signs and wonders. But the thing is, it's not just those people who are at risk of that. It's also Yahuwah's people who are at risk of that, if they are straying from his word. And even if they don't intend to stray from his word, because most people don't intend to do these things. They're enticed by what's in their own flesh. Okay, so deceptive spirits can give you a magical experience. Oh, I felt so close to Yehovah. It was like he was with me every day of my life. I was walking and he was giving me all these signs and all of this. And you know, I was having these incredible dreams from Yehovah and it was all amazing. Not necessarily true. I'm not saying that Yehovah cannot work like that in the life of people, but it's not really what we see in scripture, is it? Okay, we, we must always go to scripture to stay under that protection, to know, well, do we ever see this happening to anyone in scripture? No, we don't. Or we do, but we see it happening in a different form. When dreams are given, Yehovah will come and directly speak to the person in the dream, and they'll know that it's Yehovah that is speaking. Okay. So Asatan, lure somebody out from under the protection of the world. Deceptive spirits can come. A person can think that they're having this incredible spiritual experience, and it's all deception. These are things to watch out for.
First John 4, 1 said, Beloved ones, do not believe every spirit, but prove the spirits. How he used to do this? He used to do it with the word of Elohim. Does this fit with the word of Elohim, or am I just having a magical spiritual experience that is outside of the word of Elohim? I'm outside of the covering. I'm outside of the armor of Elohim here. A refining pot is for silver, a furnace for gold, but Yahovah tries the hearts. Okay, this is what it's, he's doing in all of these things. Do you want these? Do you want these incredible spiritual experiences? Do you want to go after prophets, dreamer of dreams, with all their signs and wonders? Do you want to have this magical spiritual experience, or do you want Yahovah? Do you want his word? Do you want to just walk righteously before him and be protected from these things? Okay, we, we've, uh, as we've been approved by Elohim to be entrusted with the good news, so we speak not as pleasing men, but again, Elohim reproves the hearts. This is throughout scripture all the way through it. Matthew 26, 40 to 41. This is when they're in the garden of Gethsemane. It says, and Yeshua came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, so were you not able to watch with me one hour? Okay, Peter's supposed to be watching. So he says, watch, do what I've told you to do. What does he say? Again, he says, pray lest you enter into trial. Why? Because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So again, here we see this spiritual warfare. And we see that part of the spiritual warfare is praying that you do not enter into trial. I don't claim to know how it works, but this is an important thing. Okay, because the spirit can be willing, but the flesh is weak, and the spiritual warfare is between the flesh and the spirit. First Corinthians 10, 11 to 13 these things came upon them as examples that are written as a warning to us on whom the end of the ages have come. And you can say that of any scripture, not just of the ancient Israelites coming out of Egypt. Okay, any scripture. What happened to Peter right there? These, happened, these are written as a warning to us. So that he who thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. No trial has overtaken you except such as is common to man. And Elohim is trustworthy, who shall not allow you to be tried beyond what you are able. So Elohim tests the hearts, okay? And he does it by all the means that we've looked at. If you want to use the word spiritual attacks, that would be a, a proper context for the, that phrase, okay? But when a trial comes upon us, nobody can claim that the trial was too difficult. No one could claim that they needed to sin, okay? No trial has come on you except such as is common to man. Same trials that have been happening all the way throughout history, the same things that have been easy to beat. Elohim's trustworthy. When he says in his word, these things that I'm commanding you today through Moshe are not too hard for you, that's trustworthy. And he will not allow you to be tried beyond what you are able. So if anybody ever says to you that a trial came up in their life that was too hard for them to pass, they're declaring the word of Elohim to be a lie. They're declaring that Elohim is not trustworthy and he did allow them to be tried beyond what they were able to. Okay, so nobody has an excuse when they're tried. The trial is not too hard. The trial has been specifically designed for you. But with the trial shall also make the way of escape, enabling you to bear it. So again, equip yourself with these things. If anybody, you're ever speaking to anyone and they say that the trial was too difficult, they're declaring this to be a lie, okay? This is the truth that you can come back with that because that's the voice of Hasatan. This command which I'm commanding you today is not too hard for you. That's the truth, okay? If people want a scripture to quote to Hasatan when it's, oh, this trial is too difficult for me to pass, okay? This is one of the scriptures that you can have in your spiritual war chest. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim. A reasoning, this trial is too difficult for me. I'm not able to pass this test. Okay, we've been equipped with those spiritual weapons so that we can take those thoughts captive and make it obedient to the Messiah, make it obedient to the word. Being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. The word actually says a whole load about spiritual warfare, but it's not the application of these verses that most people give. And 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 talks of the schemes of Hasatan. Ephesians 6 11 
talks about us having power to stand against the schemes of Hasatan by the word of Elohim. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceptive workers masquerading as apostles of Messiah. So we're warned here that there's going to be people who go out as apostles of Messiah who are just false apostles. No wonder for Hasatan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. So what you're going to have is you're going to have people masquerading as servants of righteousness. And this kind of brings us, about, brings us to another scheme of Hasatan that we need to look at. And this is deliverance ministry. Okay? It's funny to me that deliverance ministry is always performed by people who don't follow the Torah. Okay, that's, that's where it came from. It came from lawless people in disobedience. So you've got this idea that we've looked at, that we are spiritual warriors, that we go out to spiritual warfare against these entities, that that's what the struggle against them is. But we don't actually come against these entities. The struggle that we have is in our flesh. Okay, Yehovah's angels have spiritual warfare with these enemies, but that's not the same thing. So as we've seen, Hasatan's scheme is to get somebody to stray from the word of Elohim. He comes with an enticement. The person leaves the protection and now they're vulnerable. They're vulnerable to these schemes. They're vulnerable to these deceptive spirits which are going to uh, attack them. A deceptive spirit, because this person has been enticed out from under the protection of Yehovah, is now able to influence this person's life. So this, in this case, this enticement is sin. Okay, the pleasures of sin. That's what the enticement is. This person leaves and now there's a deceptive spirit that can influence them. The deceptive spirit, through whatever means, brings to them the information that perhaps they need deliverance. Maybe they feel like they're led to it and then Yehovah confirmed it to them when it was no such thing. It was uh, a deceptive spirit. So this person now thinks that they need deliverance. They've got a problem. They've got a pornography addiction. They're addicted to drugs. Okay? What do they think? They need deliverance. Okay? Or it could be a Christian or one of Yehovah's people, a Torah keeper who comes under the influence of this deception outside of the word of Elohim, which you are inherently outside of the word of Elohim if you think that deliverance ministry is anything because you never find any of that in in the word. So they tell them, you need deliverance. Deliverance minister comes along to deliver this person from this sin, which they are just willfully committing. And they ask, has anyone in your family ever been involved in anything occult? My parents were Freemasons. That's what it is. My parents were Freemasons. I don't have to take responsibility for this. I don't have to stop saying, it's it's my parents' fault. They were Freemasons and now I'm under this spiritual bondage and now I'm just being caused to, ah, it all makes sense now. The spirit of Freemasonry is powerful. You must renounce each right and all of their wickedness and then you can be free of this cycle of sin. That would be great, wouldn't it, if all of the things, all of the choices that we had in life were actually down to some spiritual cause and instead of it being a difficult choice that we had to make, in our lives, we could just be delivered of it. Like, oh, that, that looks a bit difficult for you there. I'll just take that away from you. Oh, that's not how it works. Hasatan is very happy in that instance to take away the sin. Because what has he done in that instance? This person has been deceived by either spirit, deliverance minister under a deception, somebody under a deception, but they've been deceived that their sin was caused by a demon. And that they will be delivered from it if they go to a deliverance minister. They renounce Freemasonry. They've been involved in this wacky, unscriptural ritual. Hasatan's happy to take the sin away then. Or to take the enticement away. Because he's achieved his purpose. He can come back to this person anytime he wants. Because they're outside of the word of Yehovah. Hmm. Again, somebody in the protection of Ye Yehovah. Hasatan entices them out with some kind of sin. person comes out from the protection and then the demonic activity in this person's life is 
a demon, you know, maybe they're suffering sleep paralysis, whatever the situation is, they're being physically attacked by a demon, but it's because of something wrong with their spiritual walk. Again, someone might come along and say, wow, there's, a, there's some kind of demonic thing that's happening in your life. You need deliverance ministry. You need to get rid of this spirit. Maybe it's the person's congregation. They all believe in deliverance ministry. You need deliverance. Okay? Well, they're all outside of the word of Elohim, as you'll often find in your Christian churches. Okay? They all tell them, you need deliverance. And yet they're all walking completely lawlessly. They've got no idea of the scriptures. This person now thinks that they need deliverance to get rid of this spirit. All of this, the sin in their life, that's just been forgotten. Deliverance minister comes along and says, do you have any items that may have spirits attached to them? Hmm. Person says, I've, I've got a really dodgy statue. I knew that this was a problem up in this in my house. Get rid of the statue. Then the demon goes. Demon's happy to go. Because the demon's there as part of this deception. The demon's gone now and this person thinks that the thing that was causing the demon to be there in the first place was this dodgy statue that they had and not the sin that they have in their life. So these are the schemes of Hasatan. These are the way that he works. These are the deceptions that he brings. Praise Yehovah. The demon has gone from my life. And now I'm completely outside of the word of Yehovah and I'm vulnerable to spiritual attack whenever Hasatan wants me to. It doesn't have to be that demon. That demon can go and do whatever it wants. Maybe it's some kind of other deception. All that matters to Hasatan is that you are outside of the word of Yehovah. Deliverance ministry. Now this might be a bit hard for people to accept on first blush. But deliverance ministry and coming against these spirits that have been set in places of authority is not for us to be involved in. They've been placed in those positions of authority. We don't just come against them and say, we're going to battle against those things and get rid of those authorities that Yehovah has set up. Jude 8 uh, to 10 says, In the same way, indeed, these dreamers defile the flesh and reject authority. We are deceived into doing the same thing when we are trying to tell people to have deliverance ministry and vanquish this thing that has got authority in their life. Reject authority, speak evil of esteemed ones. And the example of speaking evil of esteemed ones is quite striking. But Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moshe, presumed not to bring against him a blasphemous accusation, but said, Yehovah rebuke you. Okay, so the example of speaking against the authority and speaking evil of esteemed ones is to speak against Hasatan. These blaspheme that which they do not know and that which they know naturally like unreasoning beasts in these they corrupt themselves. And regrettably, this is the position that we can find ourselves in if we stray from the word and we try to deal with spiritual matters in a way that is not uh, according to the word. We read before, 2 Peter 2, 10 to 12, and most of all those walking after the flesh in filthy lust, despising authority, thinking little of authority, bold, headstrong, speaking evil of esteemed ones, and people are deceived into doing this against the authorities that Yahweh has put in place. Whereas angels who are greater in strength and power do not bring a blasphemous accusation against them before the master. But these like natural unreasoning beasts have been born to uh, be caught and destroyed blaspheme that which they do not know. So what is it to blaspheme? Okay, we look at the word a blasphemous in the Greek. Okay, speaking evil is one of the outlines of biblical usage. But in order to understand what this word actually means, we need to look at these two words because it's, it's comprised of these two words. Okay, blapto, which means to hurt, harm, or injure. Okay, what do you hurt, harm, or injure? The word is fame, from where we get the English word fame, and it means fame, report, okay, basically uh, someone's re reputation or someone's fame or whatever, you know, someone's name basically. So blasphemy is to speak evil of this authority, okay? That's why Michael can bring a blasphemous accusation against Hasatan. We must be careful that we don't do these exact same things. Now Luke 9, 1 to 6 is something that I'm sure that people who watch this online will bring up. Okay. 
Having called his 12 disciples together, he gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases. So people will read this and they'll say, look, see, the believers, we were given power and authority over all demons. But who was given power and authority in this example? It's his 12 disciples, wasn't it? Not us. He sent them to proclaim the kingdom of Elohim and to heal the sick. He said to them, take no matter at all for the journey, neither staffs, nor bags, nor bread, nor money, neither have two undergarments. And it's funny, isn't it, that people want to take this on themselves. They'll say, oh yeah, when he commanded them and he sent them out, he gave them power over all demons. Now we've got power over all demons. Have we? Should we take nothing for the journey? Should we have no money or staffs or not even two changes of underwear? Is that what Yeshua was commanding for us? I don't think it was, was it? Context is everything. Whatever house you enter, stay there and go out from there. And as for those who do not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the dust from your feet as a witness against them. And going out, they went through the villages, bringing the good news and healing everywhere. They were preparing the way for Yeshua, as we'll see. And Luke 10, it says, After this, the master appointed 70 others. Okay, he appointed these 12, then he appointed these 70 others. And sent them two by two ahead of him into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is indeed great, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray the master of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Go, see, I send you out as lambs into the midst of wolves. Do not take a purse, nor bag, nor sandals, and greet no one along the way. You're going to have to get rid of those, I'm afraid, Charlie. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if indeed the son of peace is there, your peace shall rest on it. And if not, and shall return to you. Who was this given to? This was given to these 70. Okay, we can't just take this upon ourselves. The 70 then come back to him. Okay, and he also goes on and says, and stay in the same house, eating and drinking, whatever with them, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not move from house to house. And into whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat whatever is placed before you. And heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of Elohim is come near to you. So this is, they were given this commission specifically for them at this time. The 70 returned with joy saying, Master, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So he appointed them with the same thing that he appoints to the uh, 12. And he said to them, I saw Hasatan falling out of the heaven as lightning. See, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and rule over all the power of the enemy. Just because they were believers, they didn't have this power. He gave them this authority. I give you this authority over all the power of the enemy. Okay, so they had this authority. But do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names have been written in the heavens. Again, people love to take scriptures out of context and then say, look, see? Take verse 19 out and say, see, look, we were given the authority right here. Right here we were given authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Another piece of scripture that people will bring up, and th this is a very questionable piece of scripture because in the two oldest Greek manuscripts that we've got, this passage is not in there. However, I would not say that it, you shouldn't believe it as scripture because we don't have any evidence that it's not. And in fact, in these two Greek manuscripts, there is space left after where it ends in Mark 16, 8. So... Was it left for this? It might well have been left for this. There might have been some reason. I can't declare this not to be scripture. But let's just treat it as scripture for now. Even if this is scripture, this doesn't affect anything. He said to them, go into all the world and proclaim good news to every creature. He who is believed and has been immersed shall be saved, but he who is not believed shall be condemned. And these signs shall accompany the ones who believe. In my name they cast out demons and shall speak with new tongues. Does this scripture give us authority over demons? Does it give us authority over all the power of the evil one? It doesn't. In Yeshua's authority, they'll cast out demons. They haven't been given authority. We haven't been given authority. Yeshua has the authority, as we'll see in another scripture that people will bring up. They shall take up snakes, and, they sh and if they drink any deadly drink, it shall by no means hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall get well. Okay, so let's treat this as if this is scripture because we've, we, can't, we can't prove that it's not. This is the other scripture that 
people will bring up. And understanding this allows us to understand the last scripture that we looked at. What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who are believing according to the working of his mighty strength, which he wrought in the Messiah when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies? Far above all rule and authority and power and mastery and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And people get what is being said here mixed up because then they claim this to themselves because of this verse. It says, and he put, under, uh, put all under his feet and gave him to be head over all to the assembly. So they kind of misunderstand this and they think that being head over all is what is given to the assembly. But it wasn't. What was given to the assembly was Yeshua gave him to be head over all the assembly, which is his body, the completeness of him who fills all in all. So who has the authority here? Is it us? It's not. All rule and authority and power and mastery was put under his feet. And he's the head of the assembly. Okay, so this is why people misunderstand these things. This is where they go astray in it. But we can't just take these things and then blasphemously speak against the enemy who were there by the authority of Yehovah in the first place. Okay, so it's a pretty uh, all-encompassing look at the spiritual realm. I can't think of anything else that needs to be covered. So this is the conclusion. Uh, Solomon uses this as the conclusion to his question, what's the point in life, basically? What we're here to do, if we're all going to die then what's the point in life? Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear Elohim and guard his commands, for this applies to all mankind. For Elohim shall bring every work into judgment, including all that is hidden, whether good or whether evil. So do we need to concern ourselves with any of this? Do we need to concern ourselves with going out against these spiritual authorities? We don't. All we need to do is very, very simple. And we've seen it in each of the parts. The conclusion of the entire matter Put on the armor of Elohim. Walk in the word of Elohim and you're going to be fine. Amen.